Okay, hi everybody. Thanks for being here. Um, I'm Kimia, for everyone who doesn't know me. Um, I'm a third year resident here at, uh, in the medicine program. And I'm gonna be talking about milk today, all about milk. Um, who here likes to drink regular milk? Show of hands. <laughs> okay, well, um, a lot of people have different beliefs about milk and we'll get into that a little bit more. <clears throat> no disclosures. So is it a fact or myth that whole fat dairy increases cardiovascular risk? Um, this is actually a pretty controversial topic that I soon found as I was looking into this, um, into this topic a bit more, but um, a lot of people have their differing beliefs about it and um, there's a lot of different uh, research both ways, but I'm gonna try to summarize that all today. So the objectives will be to describe the current guidelines for dairy intake and dietary fat consumption and the evidence behind this. I'm briefly gonna describe the studied uh, biological mechanisms underlying the beneficial effects of whole milk dairy. And then I'm gonna go into a broad range of current evidence on the relationship between whole fat milk and cardiovascular risk. I'll be touching on implicit bias a bit at the end. So cardiovascular disease is the number one cause of death globally, um, and dietary patterns, especially fat intake, have long been implicated in the modula modulation of cardiovascular risk, um, mainly through the intake of saturated fatty acids and trans fatty acids um, that's been believed to enhance the risk of cardiovascular disease, mainly through LDL and the increased proatherogenic effects of that. So the AHA, American Heart Association, has stated that lowering dietary saturated fats is important for reducing cardiovascular events and substituting them with unsaturated fatty acids um, is what we should be doing as unsaturated fatty acids are protective in cardiovascular disease um, in many studies. So some of the initial studies that kind of paved way for uh, this belief um, the main one was the seven country study that was in the f late 40s and 50s um, by this uh, researcher, Ansel Keys, who's actually the pioneer of, uh, of this idea. Um, this was the landmark epidemiologic longitudinal study that um, tried to look at the relationship between diet, lifestyle, and cardiovascular disease in different populations mostly these seven countries here. So as I've outlined there, um, all kind of um, higher income countries. Um, so they looked at men and they did baseline exams of them through many, many years and got dietary surveys and followed them up to track their health outcomes, including cardiovascular events and mortality. And what he found was that there's a strong correlation between saturated fat intake and coronary heart disease mortality. So this paved the way for what we know as the Mediterranean diet today and kind of led to like a snowball effect of a lot of research into this. So there's been a lot of uh, criticisms of this study. Firstly, they, uh, some people have said this specific um, seven countries were selected for, for um, you know, the purpose of supporting his, his findings. Um, and some of the dietary surveys, uh, you know, that's known to be kind of not the best way to, it's not as accurate and uh, reliable methods of, of uh, conducting research. Um, and then uh, there's also maybe a limited scope with this because it's not um, probably generalizable in like a global context with just these few countries he, he had used. Um, additionally, there's some idea that the changing diets over time, which he didn't, take into account um, may be affecting his data as well. Um, and there's also some speculation that he had some incomplete data reporting and didn't report all of his findings and only the ones that supported his, his, um, his conclusions. Another big study that's actually still happening now is the Framingham Heart Study in the 1960s. So this is a longitudinal study um, out of Framingham, Massachusetts. Uh, they included several thousand people and actually um, included their offspring through the generations. So still happening now. Um, so they, they would get regular examinations, they get their health histories over time and follow up on them. Um, and while this wasn't primarily focused on fat intake, this study uh, was the first of its kind and provided a lot of valuable insights into cardiovascular risk, um, mainly that elevated serum cholesterol is a risk factor for coronary heart disease and kind of started their awareness about lipid levels in the blood. 
And then uh, just to briefly touch on some of the early clinical trials in the 60s and 70s, these are core trials that actually the American Heart Association uses today in its guidelines and recommendations. Um, and basically, these four studies were all randomized control studies substituting saturated fats with unsaturated fats. And the meta-analysis of them is showing that there's a reduction in um, coronary heart disease um, with, with this um, switch to unsaturated fatty acids. So that brings us to the current guidelines now. So the U.S. Dietary Guidelines for Americans is stating that we should limit uh, saturated fats to less than 10% of our calories and replace with unsaturated fats. Um, similarly, the American Heart Association and ACG um, says that actually we should further reduce saturated fats to 5 to 6% of our total energy intake. Um, so thus, whole milk and dairy, uh, dairy foods, including milk, cheese, yogurt, um, they got lumped into this and because they're all leading sources of saturated fat in the diet. So we are encouraged to drink low-fat and fat-free dairy foods. So are these guidelines outdated? Um, I'm just going to briefly talk about this, but there's many reviews of, and studies showing actually no significant association between saturated fat and uh, coronary artery disease or mortality. Some are even showing a lower risk of stroke with higher consumption of saturated fat. <laughs> Um, there is um, the belief that saturated fat uh, consists of several different fatty acids, so it's not just one type, and they all have different um, effects on the body and different properties. And now there's this new thought about the food matrix, which is uh, thought to be more important for the effect of cardiovascular disease, which is kind of not just the nutrients in the food, but it's like the whole um, structure of the food, how it interacts with uh, other molecules and enzymes um, and the whole context. Um, also, these nutritional studies are really difficult and a lot of times they account, they don't account for confounding factors. So the dietary advice to simply decrease total fat intake and saturated fat has actually been largely un unsuccessful in reducing cardiovascular disease risk. Um, this is just showing the major naturally occurring saturated fatty acids, um, so by different chain lengths, so there's lots of different types. This is just the main few ones and different foods, but on the right here you see cheese, milk, and meat all have these varying different types of fatty acids with different chain lengths and different properties, so a lot of research going into, into this. And they all have different effects on our blood lipid levels apparently as well. But I'm not really going to be talking about saturated fat today um, and cardiovascular risk. That's a whole other lecture and uh, would take so much time to do that. But I'm going to be focusing on whole fat dairy and um, cardiovascular disease related to that. So the current lit literature actually indicates that whole milk dairy food doesn't increase the risk for cardiovascular disease and actually could help reduce various uh, metabolic disorders despite its saturated fat content. Just a little bit about the science that I found. Um, there's a whole journal of dairy science, so uh, there's a lot of research going into this, but this is just skimming the surface. Um, milk fat is really complex, so it's actually the most complex naturally occurring fat in food. Um, there's greater than 400 unique fatty acids in it. Um, whole milk is mainly saturated fat, so it's two thirds saturated fat. Um, but it's really unique in that there's this milk flat fat globular membrane, um, which is a unique trilayer membrane that surrounds the lipid core. Um, and this milk fat globular membrane is what they call the milk polar lipids. Um, and what they've seen is that churning milk actually disrupts this membrane, and uh, that's the way that you get butter. But um, similarly, commercial processing of milk uh, to make low fat and fat free dairy foods results in the removal of this membrane. Um, significantly reducing the level of the milk polar lipids. Um, and so whole milk dairy foods, with the exception of butter, have rich amounts of this milk, milk flat globular membrane, but low fat and fat free foods do not. So why is this important? There's a lot of studies, just to briefly go over one that I found interesting, was that these dietary polar lipids are actually natural emulsifiers in food. And so when you ingest them, they're very effective at limiting the absorption of cholesterol. Um, so in that way, they may improve cardiovascular health by reducing intestinal cholesterol absorption with this emulsification and leading to improved um, cholesterol levels in the blood. 
And there's even some research that it improves your like inf inflammation, reducing CRP levels, a lot, a lot of stuff going into that, which I won't touch on today. So some of now the current studies, more recent studies trying to figure this out. I'm just going to be ta talking about a few randomized controlled trials just to show you an example of how these are done. But this um, study looked at 72 patients with metabolic syndrome and did a four-week run-in period with limited dairy intake, less than three servings a week of nonfat milk, and then randomized them to one of three diets, limited dairy um, and then more dairy amounts of low-fat or full-fat milk and basically looked at the changes in their lipids and blood pressure and found that in um, these people, a diet rich in full fat dairy had no effects on their lipid profile or blood pressure compared to diets limited in, in these um, dairy products. Similarly, there's another study looking at type 2 diabetes with 111, 111 subjects with diabetes who consume less than three servings of dairy a day, again, random, randomly assigning them into three groups, control group, which was maintaining their dairy intake, low fat and high fat, which greater than three servings of low and high fat dairy, respectively. And at 24 weeks, there was no difference again in all these different parameters, A1C, body weight, um, lipids, and blood pressure between the three groups. So there's a lot of studies out there like that. So I looked at this, um, there's this systematic review and meta-analysis that tries to synthesize all the information given that there's so much kind of conflicting um, data out there to see if we can figure out what really uh, put the puzzle together and get some in more information about how this works. So this was 17 randomized control uh, trials, a broad range of patients that they looked at. Um, briefly going to go through the forest plots of this. So um, this is looking at high versus low dairy consumption in general on cardiovascular disease and the intake of dairy products was not associated in this study with cardiovascular, in this meta-analysis with cardiovascular disease. Um, there are a few uh, stragglers here that actually show a signal towards uh, re uh, improved relative risk with dairy product intake. And then again, this is looking at coronary heart disease, same thing, but total dairy product intake and high fat dairy <coughs> products were actually neutral for coronary heart disease risk in this meta-analysis. Again, with some um, studies actually showing a significantly lower risk um, for, I think, MI and ischemic heart disease. And then lastly, I thought this was really interesting, the um, effects on stroke. So the risk of stroke actually had a significant inverse association in the majority of the studies. Um, two studies actually showed a significantly lower risk with high fat products. So I think they're up here somewhere, but um, very interesting to me. And then lastly, before I get to the meat of it, is uh, there's a graph on blood pressure changes. So this is showing that um, effective dairy products on blood pressure in, in eight studies, and there was a significant reduction in systolic and diastolic um, blood pressure in, in several studies with dairy intake. And there's different types. There's total dairy, there's fermented, so a lot of, a little bit of heterogeneity in the studies, but. So um, the next few slides is kind of what I want everyone to take away from this, if, if you take anything away, um, is this large multinational prospective cohort study called the PURE study. So this, is, this was trying to replicate the seven country study, which, um, but maybe do it a little bit better, more accurately. So they looked at 135,000 individuals from 21 countries this time and five continents and actually included mostly low and middle income countries versus uh, seven countries study, which was primarily high income countries. And so they um, recorded their dietary intakes of dairy products using country specific validated food, fre food frequency questionnaires um, and further grouped that into whole fat and low fat dairy uh, and looked at these primary heart outcomes of mortality, major cardiovascular events, um, and this was ongoing for over 10 years. So they recorded like 10,000 composite events. And so what mainly was found is that dairy consumption was associated with a lower risk of mortality and major cardiovascular disease events in this diverse, large multinational cohort. And then more recently, this last June of this year, there was a follow-up of this peer study um, submitted and, and presented 
with the recent development of this healthy diet score. So um, essentially, they uh, worked on developing a healthy diet score from the peer study to see if there was consistency of the association of the score with events that they saw from five large independent studies from 70 countries. So um, basically, they looked at the peer study plus four other big studies, which are clinical trials, I think I can name a few, Transcend, um, On Target, Inner Heart, I don't know if any of these ring a bell, but they all look at different, um, different things um, and have a lot of participants. So essentially, they developed this healthy diet score based on six foods, each of which has been associated with lower risk of mortality fruit, vegetables, nuts, legumes, fish, and dairy, mainly whole fat, and they created a range of scores from zero to six, zero being least healthy, and um, six or um, five and above being most healthy. Sorry, I don't think you can really see that chart, but, um, and then they looked at outcomes. So this chart is supposed to be showing um, the nutritional profiles by the pure healthy diet score in that general population that they found. So as you can see, like the, if you look at dairy, for example, um, patients who were most healthy in the greater than five category uh, had this much amount of dairy per day, 185 grams per day. They had uh, 256 grams per day of fruit, um, higher amounts of these things that were associated with lower uh, mortality. Um, and then versus the least healthy group, which actually had like 66% um, more carbohydrates and right here, and less amount of fats and less amount of protein as well. So the results of this pure healthy diet score association with events was a follow-up of nine years. And so they compared the diet score of less than one points with a score of greater than five points. And that score of greater than five points was associated with a lower risk of mortality, cardiovascular disease, MI, and stroke. Um, this was similarly found in three independent studies looking at vascular patients. Um, a higher diet score was also associated with lower risk of death or cardiovascular disease in regions with lower income. Um, and the PURE study actually showed slightly stronger significant associations with death or cardiovascular disease than some of the other common diet scores we have from, for example, the Mediterranean diet. Um, there's also this, um, this also very limited diet, planetary diet, which is very limited. Um, but essentially, you see in the graph here that the hazard ratio was uh, much lower in, in, in this pure healthy diet score versus events. Um, in patients who had prior coronary vascular disease or no prior cardiovascular disease as well. So the conclusion is that a diet higher in these specific foods, fruit, vegetables, nuts, fish, whole fat dairy, was associated with, again, lower cardiovascular disease and mortality in all world regions, especially in countries with lower income where the consumption of these foods is low. And then I thought this chart was useful because they tried to translate this healthy diet score into healthy eating patterns, which is actually really practical, I think, for the population. Um, and so what they're showing is that, you know, fruits and veggies, uh, four to five servings a day, um, which what counts as a serving, like an apple, a banana, half a cup of veggies, really simple and practical to tell people to do. Um, dairy is here also 14 servings weekly, they're saying, and one cup of milk is a serving or one and a half ounces of cheese. So also um, good to know is that unprocessed meat, meats made this list too. So moderate amounts of uh, unprocessed meats can be a part of a healthy diet. So three ounces of cooked red meat or poultry which is also a common um, belief that that's not very healthy. So conclusion, so there is substantial evidence that whole milk dairy actually doesn't increase the risk for cardiovascular disease despite its saturated fat content and actually can be, is protective and improves mortality in, in a lot of these studies. Um, food, especially full fat dairy, is more than just the sum of its part. It's really complex. It's got a complex physical and nutritional structure and it can influence different um, biologic effects. Um, so dietary guidelines shouldn't be nutrient specific. They should be more food based. Um, and so this is kind of one of the charts indicating 
whole fat dairy, processed meat, dark chocolate, which have all complex food matrix and high saturated fat content, but no real evidence for increased cardiovascular risk. So just quickly to touch on implicit bias, um, there, this study tried to um, figure out if there's um, you know, some positive, uh, per positive perceptions of dairy versus negative associations with it or more towards plant-based alternatives. And what they found was that actually a lot of people, 73% had a stronger positive bias towards dairy. Um, however, if they had a bias towards plant-based alternatives, they were more likely to purchase those and replace dairy milk with it. Um, a lot of uh, parents were called drinking milk as a kid, but they, a lot, of, most of them, actually half of them are neutral towards their child's milk consumption, interestingly. So the thought is that there's a lot of negative media messaging about milk dairy and more positive me messaging towards plant-based alternatives now. Um, and I think what's thought is that the uncertainty is about hormones, antibiotics, animal welfare, sustainability, and you know allergies, all these things I think are things that we should focus on addressing or big dairy you should try to address to, to kind of um, help with the preconceptions about milk. And that's it. <laughs> Thank you. Are there any uh, questions or comments <laughs> from the audience? Dr. Fitzgibbons. This was really good, Kimmy, just very quickly. I think the other important historical context to remember is that the generation before the Seven Countries staff um, trial actually, I think, had experienced a lot of rickets and a lot of public health um, reasons that they subsequently, um, I think, flooded, they like public schools, et cetera, with free milk programs. And I think that then what happened was perhaps a bit of a backlash to that to say, was this actually the right thing to do? Was this a healthy thing to do? So it's really interesting to have heard it uh, swing back and forth for a variety of different reasons. Yeah, um, now that you bring up the, the whole rickets thing, which is which is um, really important, there's a lot of um, concern about like vitamin D and calcium levels in the population. I think um, that is another reason why they're hoping that dairy intake is something that increases again, because a lot of the populations that don't, um, that are vitamin D deficient, like um, uh, non-Hispanic Asians, and, um, they actually have lower intakes of dairy. So um, just another thought I had related to. <laughs> Thank you. Any other questions or comments? I know I, for one, was forced to drink skim milk for most of my childhood and <laughs> led to a, an aversion to milk as an adult, and which got even worse now that I'm lactose intolerant. So. <laughs> but think of all the things, I, all the joy I could have had when I was a kid that I missed out on. Um, okay, so we're going to vote. Um, is it a myth, whole fat dairy in diet increases risk of cardiovascular disease? So how many think that this is uh, still a true statement, that in spite of all the current recommend, I'm actually surprised that the recommendations haven't changed yet about this, but maybe I shouldn't be surprised. Um, nobody? Uh, anybody think it's possible? Uh, anybody think this is, who thinks it's busted? Looks like just about unanimous. All right. All right, we're busted. So please enjoy your eggnog this holiday season. <laughs>